Uh, you asked for additional potential citations to authority, Your Honor. I would tender uh, one McKee, M-C-K-E-E -E versus State. That is uh, 712 Southern 2nd 837. Generally standing for the proposition that evidence relevant to a witness's possible bias, prejudice, motive, or intent is nearly always necessary to inform the jury of any um, motives regarding, in this case it was a prosecution witness, but I think it applies equally. So again, um, well, in addition to the Britain case that I cited, um, the evidence would be admissible for that purpose. But what about the rule, the evidentiary rule that you can't call a witness for the purpose of impeaching? Well, I'm not necessarily calling him to impeach him because impeachment would mean that I am contradicting some of his earlier testimony. I am perhaps calling him to impeach the testimony of Mr. Root, but that's not calling him to impeach this witness. If this witness denies or, or says something that is contradicted by the actual written record, then it may be necessary to impeach him, but I don't think he's going to deny that that's on his website. He may offer an explanation that wouldn't what, be what is what is within the website that would contradict any evidence offered by mr root well i don't know that it, well it, it as far as uh contradicting he said that the i believe he characterized mr pollock as uh, uninterested or, or unbiased or one of those that characterization i forget the exact word he used but that he placed extra testimony or extra weight on his consultation for that reason um, so it would, it would not necessarily just contradict. I think it's also either contradict or help explain. Okay, defense. It, it, it has to, if it's impeachment, it's impeachment and it has to impeach something. So let's talk about what it's being presented for. Um, and we, we read from the same Bible, so I looked at Earhart for some insight on this, and what he says is that um, it actually has to be relevant. It has to truly impeach or address an issue of bias. It, in effect, if what we're looking at is Mr. Um, th I'm sorry, this witnesses Mr. Pollock's bias and how he may have presented in a way that evidences his own personal financial interest, which I guess is the underlying request of the state that they impeach or may, you know, make believe not impeach, but impeach this witness by saying, you're, you might be trying to make money on Mrs. Zimmerman because he came to your gym. Let's just think this through for a second, and I think the court has to include within its context of authority, common sense. So let's look at it through common sense filter for a moment. This witness who wants to tell somebody to come to his gym because I trained Mr. Zimmerman, got in front of this witness, in front of this jury, and under oath said he went from a .5 a year when he first got to me to maybe a point one, that he was soft then and he's soft now. There's no financial interest that this witness furthered by his testimony. And that's why it's sort of bizarro impeachment because it doesn't impeach what it would normally impeach. If this witness came in and said, this guy is great and because of my training, he can kick anybody's butt then maybe I would come in and say, wait a minute, aren't you making money by saying that, he, that you do a great job? We don't have that. We have the opposite of that. Okay. What, what we have here and what the, the state had um, cited to the court was Britain versus State, 414, Southern 2nd, 638, and it is a Fifth District Court of Appeal case. And in that case, the state didn't call this witness in their case in chief and called him in their rebuttal. And the court indicates that rebuttal evidence explains or contradicts material evidence offered by a defendant. And the testimony delivered by the state's rebuttal witness was neither explained nor contradicted any evidence offered by the defendant in that case. Permitting the testimony, however, was not error because the court has discretion in the order of presentation. What you're trying to do with Mr. Pollock is not an order of presentation. It is to impeach your own witness. You're calling him as a witness to impeach him by saying that he's advertising on a website about the Zimmerman trial and the Zimmerman um, uh, training that he received at the gym. 
I don't think that that's allowed, and I'm going to sustain the objection. Very well, Your Honor. So I don't know how you want to handle this in front of the jury. We could tell them that Mr. Pollock is not going to be testifying, and you could call your next witness. Or we could have him come on here if you have any other questions that you wanted to ask him. This was the sole purpose? Yes, Your Honor. I was going to call him and ask him about that particular website advertisement. All right. Well, then there's the state agrees based upon the court's ruling. There's no reason to have Mr. Pollock come back into the courtroom. Yes, Your Honor. All right. We um, the next witness similarly has um, some objections to the presentation. We may as well take that up before the jury comes back in, if we could. All right. And the next witness's name is please. Is Mr. David Lee Your Honor? <coughs> All right. And what is the purpose for calling Mr. Lee? Judge, could I have just a moment? Yes, you may. Mr. Pollock is going to be released from his seat. Yes, Mr. Pollock will be released. Uh, the state is not going to be calling Mr. Lee. Right. And how about the other witness that um, the state was going to check on for tomorrow? I haven't left the courtroom to be able to check on that, Your Honor. I haven't yet known. Surprisingly, we have an objection to the presentation of that evidence <laughs> as well. Maybe to address it. Maybe we can um, proffer it. What is the name of that witness? Uh, he is Mr. Fleischman, Your Honor. And his first name? Uh, I, believe it's, I believe it's Arthur. Arthur. And what is the objection to that? Who is he? He is the, he is the agent with the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Beverage, and Tobacco uh, for whom the defendant was arrested for committing a battery on a law enforcement officer. That is who he is. Okay, and the purpose for calling him? Uh, because the defense has gone to great lengths to uh, assert that the defendant is, uh, despite all the other circumstances, um, largely incapable of fighting. Uh, I think this agent would offer a different perspective on that where he would per be permitted to testify. Specifically, he would essentially say, that while he and some of his fellow law enforcement officers were engaged in uh, arresting some persons at a bar at which the defendant was, that they had the individuals outside uh, subject to being arrested and the defendant came out, one of them, or at least one of the people being arrested was one of the defendant's friends. The uh, agents, this agent in particular, will say that he identified himself to the defendant, showed him his badge and identification, told him that he needed to leave while they were effecting the arrest of these individuals and the defendant actually attacked him. That would be his testimony. My response, Sean? One, it's a prior bad act that the state is trying to get in improperly, firstly. Secondly, of course, there's a 403 analysis that needs to be done by this court. Uh, thirdly, um, the, you need to probably know a bit more about the facts of the case just so you can uh, address it. Um, the agents were undercover at a location out by UCF and had taken a friend of Mr. Zimmerman's out bodily because Can he I have a time frame in this, please? Uh, it is 2005, Your mm -hmm. Honor, so we're talking eight years ago. Uh, before, just so the courts are aware, before um, he wanted to become a prosecutor, before he got his concealed weapons permit, where they did a background check, before he did the ride along with Sanford Police Department, the reason why all of that was probably able to be accomplished by Mr. Zimmerman was that in 2005, when these agents grabbed his friend, who seemed to be underage, dragged him outside, and I think they'll probably acknowledge that that's how they accomplished it. Mr. Zimmerman, since they were in plain clothes, I think the officers will say that at some point they brought out their lanyards, but I think uh, this court, <coughs> previous court, Judge Lester, when he addressed this very same issue, I think opined, uh, um, succinctly that the way that these things are handled out by UCF is that the agents go in there sort of, I don't know if you use the word Gestapo, but something like that. 
Anyway, so they take him outside. Mrs. Zimmerman goes outside to ask exactly what um, transpired. The officers didn't like the idea that someone was getting them in the way of what they thought that they were doing properly. And they arrested Mrs. Zimmerman. I never heard that they said that he attacked him. I don't think that's in the police report. Maybe Mr. Manti can proffer the police report to the court. But in any case, he was arrested for battery on law enforcement officer. That went to the state attorney's office who dropped it down immediately to a misdemeanor. Which you know from your experience, they hardly ever do on true police victim crimes. They just don't do it and they're told not to. Not only did it drop down from the charge to a misdemeanor, but then also opposed to the normal procedure of a case like this, it went into pretrial diversion. Having gone to pretrial diversion, he successfully completed that. They dropped the charges completely. So eight years ago, he was in fact over arrested for something. <coughs> The initial prosecutor to review it identified it as being an overcharge, dropped it down to misdemeanor, pretrial diversion, and it was dismissed outright. It bears no, va no significant probative value, both because it's ancient in time, it's ancient in act, um, and the way it was handled by the system suggests that it was a non-event even to begin with. I want to make sure that we're clear, however, that if in fact the state brings in this one prior bad act, suggesting that my client is now a fighter or something, that the very witnesses that the state attorney's office has relied on throughout this case, particularly those in, in, interviewed by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and most particularly the Federal Bureau of Investigation when they did their are you a racist interview of everybody who my client talked to, including family members, a lot of people from retreat. Okay, can you get to your point? The point is that there are probably 30 witnesses to counter this one witness that my client is peaceful, nonviolent, friendly, mellow, and everything else. Information the state, and the reason why I present it now, information okay. the state is I well aware I told you when we're at the bench, I really don't like these, you know, you do this, I'm going to do this argument. Everybody, each side is, is available to present whatever case that they want to present within the bounds of the law and the rules of evidence, and they do so at their own peril for opening any doors that may be available. So I, I don't, you know, you all are experienced lawyers and you know what you can and cannot do or should and should not do. So I don't want to hear, if you do this, I'm doing that. That will be based upon a ruling from the court as to whether or not any particular door has been opened from either side. Mr. Manti, you have indicated that you don't even know if this witness is available. We now know what um, information you seek to um, elicit from this uh, witness and we can have argument if he is in fact available and you're seeking to have him testify we can have argument before he testifies are there any other rebuttal witnesses that the state would be seeking to call no, right um, based upon that I don't know if you're going to have any sir rebuttal so we'll wait to see whether or not there's been no rebuttal, I don't think it's appropriate. Well, I don't know whether oh, or not... If, if you allow this, I'm sorry. Right. Uh, so we'll take that issue up tomorrow. I would like to then inform the jury as to where we're going in this case. So there will either be some more testimony in the morning. We'll do our jury instructions tonight, finish them up in the morning. And I'd like to tell them that we're going to start closing arguments tomorrow. How long does each side anticipate that they will take in closing? Uh, since we have opening and closing in terms of, I would say, uh, three hours. Um, I presume that only one attorney will be handing closing for the state, correct, as per your normal course? Well, I, th I think in any other times that we allow another attorney to do the rebuttal, uh, I've always done it that way, so if that's how they choose to do that. I object. Okay. Your objection is overruled. Um, I think three, three hours is certainly enough. Are there going to be a lot of uh, conversations or rulings having to be made by the court concerning, concerning the jury instructions other than what we do with a um, self-defense instruction in light of the Supreme Court's review of that instruction. There's that. There's a, a, an addition based upon a case that I've just mentioned to the state but can present to the court as well as Gibbs versus State, which is a um, slight modification to the 
self-defense instruction to identify a word that's not otherwise defined. I'll tell you now, I'll tell you when we get together. Um, then there is the circumstantial evidence, one that I think that has certainly been presented to the jury as an existing element for them to consider. And when do you anticipate having your proposed instructions to both the state and the court? I, I told them I'd get to them tonight, so I'll get them the case law and the two. And those are the two instructions. We have some argument on the um, applicability, inapplicability of manslaughter to the facts of this case. I'd like to argue that with you at some point. I think those are the three main. Um, with consultation with Mr. West and my client, there may be a couple of other polishings, but I think that's the How focus. long do you think that that argument is going to take on the jury instructions? I'm just trying to get sure. a feel for time. Oh, I, I think um, uh, half an hour. But I mean, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, circumstantial evidence is what it is. I think it's discretionary with the court for when the facts support it. It's allowable, so I'm not going to retrain anyone on that. Um, the Gibbs case, just, uh, it just um, defines provoked because it's not otherwise defined. Okay, and if you're not ready to present that to the state yet, I'd rather wait for the argument. I'm just trying oh. to get a scheduling sure. idea right now. If I were to have release the jury uh, to recess for the evening and bring them back at 10 in the morning, the state can start their two hours. If there's not going to be any further rebuttal, could start their two hours mm -hmm. portion of their closing statement. They could go to lunch. The defense can do their three hours and the state can do their hour rebuttal and we can get it to the jury by tomorrow evening or have them recess for the evening and come back Friday morning. I'm going to leave it up to them as to how long they would like to do that for. So, Is now an opportunity, maybe after the jury's we released? Need to do the Donnelly hearing also. To do Donnelly and also to address the issue of their rebuttal. And the reason why I suggest that now rather than tomorrow is if you allow that, we may well have, I, I don't want to use the quid pro quo argument to you, but that's going to take a lot of work to get Surrey Buttle witnesses together, a great deal of work, um, including all the other witnesses to that event and the well, other Well, none witnesses. of this may even occur if that witness is not available. Is there any way that you can let this court know sometime soon whether that witness is available yes. at all? Yes, Your Honor. I'm trying to check now, actually. Okay. It may be a non-issue. Okay, so we'll uh, see if we need to have the argument, I guess. Okay. Let's go ahead and bring the jury in and I'll excuse them for the day. And then we'll begin on Donnelly. Go from there. So then going to address the argument of whether or not that door has been opened before they begin their rebuttal and whether or not it's appropriate. I just want to make sure that's not waived. No, sort of nothing has been waived. I just want to know the availability of that witness because none of it may be an issue. Yes, We did file the judicial notices on the very front meetings and exhibits. gentlemen again we have some more work that we need to do outside your presence and instead of keeping you back there in the jury room I'm going to let you recess for the evening I just wanted to tell you the state of where we are um, I hate to ever tell anybody what I anticipate will happen because as soon as I say it something else occurs um, but we do anticipate to go to closing statements tomorrow and since there'll be some more work that we would have to do in the morning, I'm going to have you come back at 10 a.m. So it gives you a little bit more time in the morning. When I have you recess for the evening, I want to give you the instructions. During the overnight recess, you're not to read or listen to any radio, television, or newspaper reports about the case. You're not to discuss the case amongst yourselves nor with anybody else. 
You're not to use any type of an electronic device to get on the internet to do independent research about the case, people, places, things, or terminology. And you're not to read or create any emails, text messages, tweets, social networking pages, or blogs about the case. Do I have your assurances that you will abide by these instructions? With that, put your notepads down, follow Deputy Jarvis, and have a good evening. Please be seated. The, uh, what's been handed to me as State's Exhibit 213 is that the create the correct That's exhibit. The okay, Two. both sides agree. Yeah. And then I've been handed to Defendant's Exhibit 40, which is the weather report for February 27th. Both sides agree. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Then you are going to um, look at. Defense Exhibit 39, is there any objections to that, Judge, Trish? They emailed it to me a few minutes ago. We're verifying it, so there shouldn't be, but I just want to verify it, so it might take a little bit longer because they revised it and we just need to check. All right. Uh, are we ready to proceed about the state's um, motion for sanctions regarding Mr. Donnelly? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, previously the state had filed a request to have Mr. Donnelly's testimony stricken uh, in part due to the discovery violation that was asserted based upon his radical change in his testimony. And while the court found that there had, in fact, been a discovery violation, you found that the state had failed to establish enough procedural prejudice under the Scipio, S-C-I-P-I-O case, uh, and as well as Evans and Cassica that we had discussed at that time. Um, and so the request for any curative measure at that time was uh, denied. However, I did indicate to the court that we believed that there was some indication that the witness, in addition to that discovery violation and change in his testimony, had apparently been present in court. I did not have the con confirmation at that time. However, I have since ob obtained it. Um, we did provide counsel and I believe the court as well copies of photographs, essentially clips from videos. The witness, Mr. Donnelly, was in fact present at least two days of the court proceedings, that being the 25th and 26th of January, uh, seated with or immediately behind the defendant uh, and the defendant's family section um, and is captured on those screens and is present. I don't think there's even any real dispute that that is him. My understanding is that the, the concession is that, that it is in fact that witness. <clears throat> it is subsequent to his sitting through two days of testimony, which included uh, a number of witnesses, including Diana Smith, the crime scene tech, and significantly Jane Serdica, who identified the uh, voice that she heard screaming as a younger man's voice, a, a boy's voice, I think was her word, something to that effect. Following uh, his presence in court, the witness went home on the weekend, uh, decided to listen to the tape, contact Mr. O'Mara, and we know the history from there. I will point out that even since that time, we have learned that similar uh, things have happened with two additional witnesses. As we learned yesterday during the testimony of the defense witness, Mr. Shoemaker, witness John Good, who remained under subpoena and subject to recall, actually met with defense counsel as well as Mr. Shoemaker to discuss and uh, address and adjust and therefore change uh, the defense animation exhibit. Further, very right here today, we heard from uh, Ms. you'll have to forgive me, Bertalan, uh, who also indicated that she was present uh, and had watched, or maybe not present in court, but had watched and participated, I'm sorry, had watched and observed uh, at least a portion of the trial proceedings, including the testimony of, uh, I believe she said, the defendant's uncle. Um, and so we have, I think, established now, as far as procedural prejudice goes, that the 
witness in question, Mr. Donnelly, subsequent to sitting in court for two days, took it upon himself, I think is his representation, uh, to go ahead and, and do something which turned him from a, as the case law indicated earlier, a non-witness into a witness. Um, and Mr. Good certainly was in contact with and discussed potential testimony as well as actually a defense exhibit, um, again, in violation of the rule of sequestration. As it relates to sequestration, I did, uh, I think that the, the relevant case law as it, as it relates to what to do about potential violations of that rule um, is set forth in the four cases I provided to your honor. Again, I think the Scipio and Evans and Cassica line of cases indicate that there does need to be some showing of procedural prejudice. I think the change in testimony as well as the discussions had with Mr. Good in particular, as well as to a lesser extent, the third witness that we heard from today, Ms. Bertaland, certainly the cumulative effect of all of those, uh, those are the ones we know about at this point in time, have sufficed from the state's perspective to establish that there has been some procedural prejudice now sufficient for that. As far as the violation of the rule of sequestration, obviously the court has contempt powers over and above and independent of any of this. Um, however, the cases that I've cited to the court are, first off is the McKinsey, M-C-K-I-N-Z-I-E, which is the first DCA case, 845 Southern 2nd, 316. Um, and the first issue or the first order of business is to determine whether or not the violation was with knowledge or consent um, or connivance of the defendant or his counsel. Um, I believe as to Mr. Good, the representation I've heard is that certainly that was with the knowledge of counsel. I don't know, I think the representation as to witness Donnelly has been that that was without necessarily the knowledge of counsel, although whether defendant or any other member of his family knew, I think it's certainly open to question given the location in the courtroom that the witness was observed. Um, second issue is if it is not uh, with such knowledge, connivance, or consent, then the second way to determine this, and I'm reading from page two of the court's copy at the bottom of the left-hand column, second test to determine whether sequestration violation should preclude the witness from testifying, and the state's position is since they've already testified, the remedy is, at least as to Mr. Donnelly, the prior request to strike his testimony and give a curative instruction. Uh, was put forth in Steinhorst versus State, that's S-T-I-N-H-O-R-S-T. -S the Supreme Court restated an earlier holding from a case called Dumas, D-U-M-A-S, further explained that the test to determine whether to exclude a witness is whether the sequestration violation changed the witness's testimony from what it would have been had the rule not been violated. So again, um, before I get to the <coughs> other cases, the change in the testimony, um, certainly there's been a change in the exhibit, the animation, as testified to by Mr. Shoemaker, and I think Mr. Donnelly's change in testimony is pretty radical and pretty evident. Um, he went from testifying in his deposition that he hadn't heard anything and didn't recognize a voice to testifying at trial that he had heard something now and did recognize a voice. The next case is Scott versus State, that's 17 Southern 3rd, 766. It's a case from the fourth DCA. Uh, and on, I believe it's referenced as page four of the opinion in question or the copy, I'm sorry, page, beginning on page three and continuing on to page four. But beginning on page three, in this scenario, the, there was a defense witness who was present in court um, and then opted to express her desire to testify. She was attempted to be called by the defense. The court ruled, much like this court has ruled, that there had been a discovery violation. Um, I don't know that this court has yet determined whether that was willful or substantial, but the trial court in Scott did, and expressed concern about the violation of sequestration, and then said that the court believed and found that the defendant was not acting in good faith, but purposefully trying to thwart the prosecution, including dropping the witness on the lap of the prosecution at 1.30 yesterday. I think the court's comments in that case uh, are 
illustrative. Uh, the court said, I'm mindful of the law, but I think that Mr. Scott has been knowingly and intelligently making certain decisions in this case to his advantage and to the prejudice of the state, and to allow this witness to testify at this time would be, and the court finds, will be prejudicial to the state. The court found that a Richardson discovery violation and there is prejudice to the state in this matter that cannot be reasonably overcome based on the totality of circumstances. Um, the court goes on to say, at the bottom of that column, although the rules authorize a trial court to exclude a defense witness because of failure to disclose the witness, the law is well established the exclusion of a witness is a severe sanction which should be resorted to only after the alternative available remedies have been fully considered and deemed insufficient. In this case, as to witness Donnelly, there is literally no, no way to unring that bell other than a curative instruction and instruction to disregard his testimony. Um, so while we recognize that what we're asking for here is not quite the nuclear option, but a severe sanction, I uh, believe the case law supports that it can be done. The Scott Court approved that in that scenario. The next case in, in order um, is Steinhorst itself, which is the Florida Supreme Court case from 1982. Uh, it begins on I believe page seven of, of the copy of this court's opinion, uh, at the very bottom, head notes eight and nine, where they're again referencing the old Dumas case. And they indicate that Dumas does not outline the circumstances under which a court may properly exclude a witness for violating the rule. The test, however, is whether the testimony of the challenged witness was substantially affected by the testimony he heard to the extent that his testimony differed from what it would have been had he not heard the testimony in violation of the rule. Uh, defense counsel in that case tried to show the testimony of the witness may have been affected by what he heard. The state attorney elicited testimony contradicting this. The court made a determination in the ruling. Finally, the Dumas case sets forth the older test, still valid, but as I think Scott made clear, only one of a couple different possible ways. Um, on page two of the opinion, in the right-hand column, the witness disobeys the order of withdrawal while he may be proceeded with against for contempt and testimony open to comment to the jury by reason of the conduct. He is not thereby disqualified and the weight of authority is that he cannot be excluded on that ground merely, although the right to exclude under particular circumstances may be supported within the sound discretion of the trial court. Um, Your Honor, the state's position is that we believe, given uh, both the nature of what went on, particularly as to witness Donnelly to uh, a little lesser degree witness good and to a significantly lesser degree Ms. Bertolin, as well as the cumulative nature of it and the radical change that occurred to both uh, witness Donnelly's testimony as well as the exhibits and um, items discussed by Mr. Good in connection with Mr. Shoemaker's testimony. Uh, the state believes and would renew our request um, obviously, the court can proceed in any fashion it wishes via contempt proceedings against any of the three witnesses, but we would renew our request as to witness Donnelly that the court issue a curative instruction to the jury and order his testimony stricken or a combination thereof. Thank you. If I may, Your Honor. Mr. Manti. If I might approach, Your Honor, with some case law uh, supporting different conclusions. Uh, I don't know if we're now opening the door, so to speak, to all those potential violations. We want to talk about Mr. Good and I forget who Miss Bertillon, but maybe we can add to the list Shipping Bow, who seemed to have had a conversation with the state attorney's office where he materially changed two particular parts of his conversation. Well, I think that it's a violation of the rule of sequestration for the attorney for the attorneys to have a conversation with the potential witnesses. I didn't think so. It just seemed to be being argued by the state. So let me focus my concern with that argument. Okay. Well, let me just, before you start your argument, as far as Bella Tran, who testified today, the state covered that in cross-examination. That's a non-issue at this okay. point. Okay. Um, the state hasn't asked for any sanctions regarding Mr. Good, so that's not an issue as to this point. So it's as to Mr. Donnelly. My only concern is that if they're referencing these as though they want to sort of pile on and suggest that you should consider that we've ignored the rule all over the place, I have to respond to it. The, the court is very concerned over the fact that there are three alleged instances of violation of the rule from defense witnesses, and that's something that should have been known by counsel to not have occurred. The court will tell you that I am investigating the possibility not, I think the person may have been on both witness lists of another person who may have violated the rule 
a sequestration, although they have not been called as a witness, but I am investigating that also, so I wanted to inform um, both sides. And Great. if you want me to tell you at a later time, I, I, I don't want to say the name sure. until I conduct the investigation. That's, that's but fine. I will tell you up at the bench if you, if you sure. want to know after you finish your argument, but please go ahead. And as, as to the court's proceed. concern regarding Mr. Good, let, let's clear the record on that. Um, Mr. Good and Mr. Shoemaker never spoke. Mr. Good was shown by me the animation uh, to confirm with his trial testimony that it was, it was accurate. He told me it wasn't. I had him tell me, and I knew, of course, from his testimony, the areas of concern. I then went to my expert, an expert who, as this court knows full well, could have sat in the back of the courtroom throughout the entirety of the trial in order to get that information. I think it's absurd to suggest that an animation expert can't get information from trial testimony when it is that very trial testimony that he is supposed to do. So. In all due fairness, it was my questions of Mr. Shoemaker yesterday or last night during his testimony when he said he got the information from a conference with counsel and another person. I asked who was that other person. So that came from okay. the court asking the question. Okay, just, so just so we're clear, they never spoke because I was the intermediary to show Mr. Good the animation. He said, no, they weren't there, they were here. And I went back to my expert to make sure they came into comport with the trial testimony. So that's how the John Good issue did or did not occur, just so we're clear on that. Um, and I guess we're not going to talk about Celine Bajador's change in testimony either, since that was just directly to Mr. Delariando? No, yes, I think okay. that, that the witnesses are allowed to talk to the attorneys. And there's, I guess, the discovery violations for failure to notice us will be taken up at a later time if I right. file a motion. But this is relating to Mr. Donnelly, that the evidence presented to the court by way of pictures is that okay. he was sitting in this courtroom after the rule of sequestration had been invoked. Okay, and let's talk then about the substance of that and I'll then get into the case law. Mr. Donnelly was here, it seems, from my review of the evidence given to the state on days two and day three until the first morning break. And we'll have some testimony as to why he was removed from the courtroom at that point. Here's what, here's the testimony that he was exposed to that may have affected his testimony. Because I think as we get into it, obviously the, the impact on a witness and the whole purpose for the rule of sequestration is to avoid infecting one witness with another witness's testimony. So he did hear from Wendy Doraval, and you know her testimony as, so he heard that, it, it seems, at least he was in the courtroom for that. He heard Ms. Doraval. He also then had an opportunity to hear Donald O'Brien, the Homeless Association, and then he had a chance after that was done to listen to Ms. Celine Bahador, a, a person who never talked about the 911 tape or listened to it or heard anything, but had her own sort of interesting take on the evidence presented and, and her view of it. Um, and then uh, Sergeant Romando came in sort of just to bring in just the information, no substantive testimony. Similar with Diane Smith, she came in and identified a lot of exhibits, so he was able to sit through that but there was nothing having to do with voice identification whatsoever. The second day, she, he heard, I guess, or at least was in the courtroom for Mr. Dyker's testimony. It was during that break that, and I'll proffer that, Mr. West noticed that Mr. Donner was in the courtroom and had him leave, but we'll proffer that if necessary. So he was able to hear at least the first half of Mr. Dyker's testimony during which he didn't say anything about anything. It was the second half, but even if he was here for that, you know her testimony to be that she heard somebody scream. She didn't listen to the 911 call. She didn't opine regarding the 911 call. So he was out of the courtroom at that point. And he's, of course, present and waiting all day to testify to acknowledge this. But just so we're clear as to the violation. We also need to be clear as to what he changed, because I contested the state's suggestion yesterday that he changed his testimony. Because I said, well, he added to it. But the case law that we talk about, and, and that I'll talk to you about in a moment, really speaks to the infection of that testimony. It really speaks to how a witness has changed their opinion regarding something. What he did was not change his testimony. He added to it by, for whatever reason, waiting until two or three days before trial or during trial to make the, whatever that emotional decision was he went through to actually listen to something which he listened to. But that was not a change in testimony, though it is added to it. 
Um, and then the question is, did the violation of the rule that obviously occurred infect that testimony? I'll suggest to you, since what he heard had nothing to do with what he eventually testified to, that it didn't. Did it prompt him to finally come to grips with the fact that he should listen to the tape? Yeah, maybe so. Maybe it did. Um, but to the substance of the effect, we then have to look to some of the cases that I presented to you. Del Monte, um, which is a 1985 third DCA case, which interprets 616.1. So it gives us some insight because you need to make a determination whether or not the rule has been violated, and you need to look into the circumstances as to what you should do with it. And Mr. Manti was straightforward when he talked about the um, the sort of seminal case talking about this, which is the Dumas case, a 1977 Florida Supreme Court case. And basically, what that needs that you need to look into is to get an identification of whether or not there's been some connivance or con con collusion between the two, and whether or not we did this in some form or fashion to just, in effect, violate not only the the geography of the rule, was he in the room, but the underlying substance of the rule. And I would suggest to you that under the Dumas case, the state has woefully failed to suggest any case law that identifies that a willful violation occurred, nor a substantive violation that may have occurred. The other case law, if I might have just a moment to find it. Uh, deals again with this court's sort of requirement to make an identification of the violation, the substance of the violation, and whether or not it's appropriate to issue any sanctions. If so, then you have the right, the least, the most significant of which, or the most severe of which, is that you can exclude the witness from testifying. Certainly, there's nothing in the way this matter occurred as to Mr. Donnelly that suggests not only was it not the defense collusion or connivance or even knowledge, um, but neither either Mr. Donnelly's, and you'll ha hear testimony from him in a moment, but to proffer it if the court would allow, um, when the family, he, oh, I'm sorry, we weren't calling him as a witness. He was on the witness list, but as you know from what we did call him for, specific to the voice, that we were not calling him for any other reason. There was no, nothing that we were bringing him for substantively until Saturday came and I found out that he had relevant testimony concerning voice that he was even being called as a witness, just so we're clear about that. But he was definitely on the I'm not suggesting that that takes him out, but I think that it does affect um, our presentation and what we were going to do so that the idea that he may have been around would not have even sort of been effective to us in the way we were handling our witnesses. And I think what happened was once the state um, invoked the rule and refused to allow Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Zimmerman to be here, and Shelley Zimmerman was here by herself, that she requested Mr. Donnelly to join the seat, I guess the, the row behind her. And that was just so you understand sort of how this whole thing began with Mr. Donnelly coming into office support to Ms. Zimmerman. Um, and again, since I had never met him, uh, Mr. Mr. West, I think, met him at his deposition, but we had certainly not pre-tried him as a witness, as, you know, we've heard some testimony here before, because, just so you're clear, we had no intention of calling him. He just had nothing substantive to offer. So that just sort of comes in mind with this, this suggestion that we had any knowledge or connivance or collusion with the witness. So if, in fact, there was, a, and there was, a technical violation of the rule, then the question is, what is the remedy? Um, before you consider any remedy, I think that you need to find that, in fact, not only was there a technical violation, but there was some true substantive violation. That, in effect, having violated the rule, he gained some knowledge that was able, able to sort of mold into his testimony before the court. And there's been no finding of that. There's been no evidence or suggestion of that. And in reality, we know what his testimony was because it was quite limited. It was limited to testimony that he created, if you will, on Saturday um, before he testified. Um, and if I'm remembering correctly, and I am, that was after he had removed himself 
from the courtroom some five days before on that Tuesday, I'm sorry, on that Wednesday morning during the morning break. So again, if we sort of look at what happened, he was in the courtroom during a time that he wasn't going to be a witness, but still on the list, uh, left the courtroom when advised to by co-counsel and stayed away from both the courtroom and the trial testimony until he took on himself to listen to the tape, came to me, talked to me, and I presented him as a witness. So I don't believe that there has been any showing under the cases I presented. Again, Del Monte, Dumas, um, there are some other cases, but they stand for very similar um, presentations. Bizarre, B-I-Z-Z-A-R-D. Just for the site purposes, that is 674 Southern 2nd, 1382. And um, Atkinson. Federal, I'm sorry. Uh, Atkinson versus State, um, 317 Southern 2nd, 807. Wright versus State, a Supreme Court case back in 1985 that does give some good insight um, into what the court should look at before making a determination to um, exclude any testimony. And again, the benefit in a case like that goes towards the admission of testimony and certainly towards the defendant's right to present testimony supporting his defense. There are other cases. McKinsey was also cited by the state. Um, I won't recite that now, but only to state that um, the case, the, the entirety of the case that I presented from the cases I've cited to McMahon at 104 Federal Reporter, 3rd, um, 638, Stiles versus Bergeron, B-A-R-G-E-R-O-N, uh, 55, 559, Southern 2nd, 365, certainly give the court discretion in making determination what sanction to impose, but all stand for the proposition that it, before any sanction is imposed at all, you need to have a, a quantum of guilt uh, before you impose a sanction. Um, there has been no guilt shown. There has been a technical violation without substance, and though it is unfortunate that it occurred, um, it was certainly not, as the state might have suggested, some course of conduct because I think Mr. Good is now a non-issue as to how that occurred. I think that's not only not a violation, it's wholly appropriate and necessary for an expert to properly present his expert testimony. And um, Ms. Bertillon. Your sequence of events here, you had indicated that um, Ms. Shelley Zimmerman wanted Mr. Donnelly to be in the court <clears throat> with her. However, she was subject to the rule of sequestration also, and that occurred either at or during um, opening statements. So she wouldn't have been here for the first or third day of trial, actual trial testimony either. No, she wasn't here then, but she had made well, the request. But you said that he came to support her. My understanding was that she made the request to come by and support because mom and dad were excluded from the courtroom. Then she was excluded as well, but she asked for him to support George, in effect, Mrs. Zimmerman, um, by sitting in the row, but he couldn't sit in the family row. He sat in the row behind him. Well, I, I don't know the, I'm not clear as to what all the seats were, but my impression is to my left, the very first row is supposed to be a buffer row with law enforcement um, ability to be on there. The second row is the Martin family row, and they can choose who they want to be on that row, and they have to notify um, the sheriff's office and Ms. Kennedy regarding who they intend to have on that row. And then the rows behind them, except for the last row, uh, which is media, but the rows in between are lottery. People have to go by and get a lottery to be able to be part of the public. To my right, the very first row is the buffer row, law enforcement and others. The second row is the Zimmerman family row, and they have to go through the same procedure that they have to have authorized who appears or is allowed in the courtroom on those rows. And the rows after that are media rows. Am I wrong in my 
seating arrangement. So are um, you saying that Mr. Donnelly was seated in a media row and not the Zimmerman family? No, no, I don't want to. I don't want to offer facts beyond my knowledge. I had not met the man. Um, I've seen pictures, so I know that he was in that side. I think Mr. West had approached you a moment ago with some better insight on the facts. I don't know. I don't want to have co-counsel argue, but maybe he can clear up those facts. I just know that he was. I saw pictures of him in a courtroom on the right side. My understanding was that he was requested to appear to offer support to George because the family, George's family, was excluded. And beyond that, Mr. West may be able to offer some factual insight. Okay, Mr. West, please. Well, of course, the issue of whether or not Mr. Donnelly was here, I think, has been addressed, that he was here on Tuesday and then part of Wednesday morning, and which witnesses may have testified during the time he was here, I think, is addressed. Um, I had met Mr. Donnelly at the time of his deposition, so I, would re I was able to recognize him. And when we took that morning recess on Wednesday morning, um, as I was exiting the courtroom, Mr. Donnelly was standing there and said, good morning, and we shook hands, I believe. That was the first time that I noticed that he was in the courtroom. Certainly Mr. O'Mara didn't because he uh, didn't know, wouldn't have known how to recognize him. The clerk would have the time when that morning recess took place, but it was whenever that was, as I, uh, as I recall. Uh, I mentioned to Mr. Donnelly when I recognized him that the court had invoked the rule of sequestration and that he would have to leave the courtroom and would not as a possible witness would not be able to attend any of the court proceedings. He apologized to me, acknowledged that of course he would do that, and um, didn't express any knowledge specifically about knowing the rule had been invoked previously. To the extent that that was not communicated to him, that's the responsibility of counsel or staff. I don't have any question in my mind that Mr. Donnelly was not specifically informed about that. There's a couple of hundred witnesses on the list. There were efforts made to contact the witnesses that we anticipated would likely be called. And as Mr. O'Mara said, we did not at that time think Mr. Donnelly was, was on the list. Um, so that's basically it. I didn't tell Mr. Donnelly, nor did anyone with my office tell Mr. Donnelly specifically prior to him appearing in the courtroom that the rule had been invoked and that he could not be here. I don't believe anyone specifically from Mr. O'Mara's told, Mr. O'Mara's office told him to the extent that didn't happen, it's our responsibility. I have no reason to think Mr. Donnelly um, flaunted or in any way disobeyed an order that he was aware that the court had uh, put in place through the rule of sequestration. So all of those facts would suggest that the violation was inadvertent on his part and uh, to any extent that there was some responsibility for it, it lies with, uh, with myself or, or with staff. Okay, thank you. Um, as to the Shelley Zimmerman issue, uh, I have to limited- where he was seated? Pardon me? Was he- was he I, seated in the Zimmerman fam what's referred to as the Zimmerman family row, which would be the, the second row to my right? I can't speak to that because he wasn't seated. I can't tell by the picture. He wasn't seated when I saw him. He was standing in the public, in the corridor here, exiting a row, but I didn't note specifically which one it was. Uh, the information I had was that when um, the rule was invoked and all of the Zimmerman family that was on either the state's list or ours was excluded from the courtroom, no exceptions, and that because Ms. Um, Shelley Zimmerman, who of course, as the court will note, the state did not call, uh, but was nonetheless excluded from these entire proceedings, um, asked Mr. Donnelly, could he be here as support for Mr. Zimmerman? So um, that's my best understanding of the sequence. I, I was not party uh, to any of those conversations. I'm fit up the question. He wasn't the second row. Okay, thank you. Two points based on what I've heard, Your Honor. McKinsey, which is the 845 Southern 2nd 316, 
case says as follows where the violation was with the knowledge or consent of counsel the testimony must be excluded that is under head no one what i've just heard is that it was known that the witness had been here it was known that he was then told he had to leave because of the rule later on he was in fact disclosed his new testimony change testimony or add a testimony however we want to characterize that and the fact that he had previously been here in violation of the rule was disclosed neither to this court nor the state Scipio which is 928 southern second 1138 says only if the court can determine beyond a reasonable doubt that the in this case the defense but the state was not procedurally prejudiced by the discovery violation can the error be considered harmless um, I would point out that even accepting everything we've just heard is true it would certainly be within the courts um, purview to find that that's exactly what has happened here and that his testimony in fact under McKinsey must be excluded irrespective of the Dumas analysis as McKinsey makes clear these are two separate analyses one is where counsel knew about the violation and it was not disclosed and the other is if counsel did not we then go to all the Dumas factors about whether the testimony was in fact infected um, I would point out that Mr. Crump was also forced to be absent from the courtroom and never called thank you okay um 616.1 is the um rule of sequestration and the possible sanctions and the rule basically provides that um the court would determine that a violation had con occurred with the knowledge or convivience of a party or counsel it may then exclude the witness only if, if it finds that the testimony of the challenged witness was substantially affected by the testimony he heard to the extent that his testimony differed from what it could have been had he not heard testimony in violation of the rule and i think that that is very telling to the court and on one hand the court is very 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 concerned um, for those who want to know that was four varies um, about the rule of sequestration and the witnesses and counsel abiding by that rule and the question comes whether or not the witness themselves had the knowledge and based upon what i heard from counsel i do not believe that mr donnelly had the knowledge because it was relayed to the court that he was not specifically told in a case like this where there is a couple of hundred people on a witness list um, it is a little insurmountable to notify every single person on that list that the rule of sequestration has been invoked and especially in light of the fact that not even you know one half of those witnesses were called during the trial so i cannot make a finding that he had the knowledge now would his testimony have changed from what he heard i am not making that finding either so the motion for sanctions uh, is denied and if counsel will approach for just one moment
All right, the next order of business is going through the proposed jury instructions and knowing that there may be some suggested changes to some of the substantive ones the court wanted to go through just the general instructions at this time to see if we can um, at least have an agreement as to those yes, first one although it's not membered it's just uh, thanking the jury for their attention during the trial and paying attention to the instructions i'm about to give is there any objections from the state to this instruction no, from the no, defense no. okay and mr zimmerman do you have you don't have to stand up do you have a copy of these instructions that you can look at them with us yes sir okay if you'll please do so i appreciate it yes okay. the very first page is just the style of the case um the second page is what i just read i'm sorry will you address it no you may be seated no yeah, I wanted to make sure Mr. Zimmerman had a copy in front of him. He does, and he's reviewing him with us, Your Honor. All right. Then the second page is the statement of the charge. Any objection from the state? No, Your Honor. From the defense? No, Your Honor. Neither one of you have to stand while we go through this. We'll reserve as to the homicide instruction because it's substantive. And any suggested changes by either side, if you could give them to the other side tonight via email. So we can discuss them tomorrow. The same would be uh, second degree murder instruction. The next, we'll reserve that until the morning. The next one is possession of a firearm and discharge causing death. Is there any objections to this by the state? No, Your Honor. By the defense? Substantively, no, Your Honor. I believe that it's appropriate uh, as based upon the charge. We might readdress that when we go over second degree, but I think it's accurate. Okay. The next one is when there are lesser included crimes of, or attempts and what the state has listed in the proposed instruction is manslaughter and aggravated assault. Is the state requesting these lessers? Yes, Your Honor. Any objections from the defense? We object, Your Honor, and I think that would be something to take up tomorrow. All right. Manslaughter is a substantive one we'll bring up tomorrow. Aggravated assault is a substantive one. Possession of a firearm and discharge causing death, is that a... Is that the same as the one that... I don't see it in mind the second time, Your Honor. I thought we just addressed that one. It is, as it relates to the aggravated assault, lesser is where it is but it's the same it instruction and when the instructions are read would there be any objection to not, not reading it a second time okay i think as long as there's a reference made and we can sort of if if the aggravated assault lesser is given as long as there's a reference made to the use of a firearm before because that's the 1020 life enhancement um, and there are separate ones for aggravated assault than there are for second degree murder. Right. The next instruction is the justifiable use of deadly force and that's going to be subject to discussion tomorrow. And please, both sides take into consideration the changes that are currently before the Supreme Court on that instruction so we need to have some agreement as to how that's going to be presented to the jury. Mm -hmm. Plea of not guilty, reasonable doubt, and burden of proof. Any objection from the state? No, Your Honor. From the defense? No, Your Honor. Date of crime, any objection from the state? No, Your Honor. From the defense? No, Your Honor. Venue, any objection from the state? No, Your Honor. From the defense? No, Your Honor. Weighing the evidence, um, there's one through five are always given, and then we have six through ten. Is the state requesting any of the six through ten? I believe certainly uh, eight should apply and I believe that is the only one the state would be requesting if the defense requesting any others of six through ten none of those your honor I'd like to have a, a presentation by the state on the inconsistent testimony 
whether both sides have tried to impeach by deposition testimony or other testimony of the certain witnesses, so I do think that that does apply. Fair enough. Um, are there any six, seven, nine, or ten neither side is requesting? No, you're not. Can you please prepare a new instruction that has one through five and then number eight as number six? Yes, sir. Thank you. Expert witnesses, any objection from the state? No, Your Honor. From the defense? No, Your Honor. Defendant testifying will not be given, so defendant not testifying. Any objections from the state? No, Your Honor. From the defense? No, Your Honor. Defendant's statements, any objection from the state? No, Your Honor. From the defense? No, Your Honor. Rules for deliberation, any objections from the state? No, Your Honor. From the defense? Other than I think, I don't know what we want to do with possibly seven. I don't think there were any questions written um, that were not asked by the court. A couple of the jurors asked some oral questions more along the lines of could a witness speak, speak up or that sort of thing. So I don't think seven needs to be there. Is there um, state, I mean, sorry, defense agree with that? We do, Your Honor. So number seven will not be given if I can have an instruction that takes out number seven. Yes, Your Honor. The next instruction is regarding notes. Any objection from the state? No, Your Honor. From the defense? No, Your Honor. Cautionary instruction, any objection from the state? No, Your Honor. From the defense? No, thank you, Your Honor. Verdict, any objections from the state? No, Your Honor. From the defense? No, Your Honor. Submitting case to the jury, any objections from the state? No, Your Honor. From the defense? No, Your Honor. And then we have a state's proposed special jury instruction number one. I'll, we'll argue that tomorrow. Are there any other proposed jury instructions that are not covered in this packet from the state? Not at this time, Your Honor. From the defense? I apologize. I was using a copy that I guess I now see it. I didn't have the state's proposed it's special. It's the very reason. last page. Last page that they gave me just now. Okay. Thank you. All right. Are there, other than what we've discussed with the substantive ones that may have some changes, are there any other special instructions going to be requested by the defense? There will be some. Oh, other than the ones we've just discussed? Right. No. The ones that I'm reserving on, changes that may be to that, are there any additional proposed special instructions. No, Your Honor. I'm going to need a proposed verdict form. Yes, Your And if you can give a couple of scenarios, one that includes both lesser included offenses, one that includes one and then the other um, lesser included, and then you need, they have to include the firearm. Certainly. Are there any other matters that we need to take up this time regarding the instructions? No, you are. Thank you. Just so I'm clear, the defense will be requesting some proposed special instructions, but we're going Just to get those later. Just changes to yes. the instructions on the substantive charges. Is that correct? That's correct. And those will be exchanged tonight via email. That's not the well, you can talk after court about that, otherwise they will email it uh, to the state overnight so we could be prepared to talk about it in the morning. Do you think it's going to take more than an hour tomorrow to go over these jury instructions? Hour or so. Um, so then we'll be the back argument. in recess at 8.30 because I have the jury coming in 10 for closing arguments. I'm going to ask that we delay closing arguments um, for enough time to give both uh, the state and the defense time to prepare for what we have to do tonight, for tomorrow morning, and then for closings. There's a lot of testimony, a lot of evidence, and right. it's just... We'll begin organized. closings at 1, and we'll let the state go through their closings. The defense can do their closing on tomorrow is, what, Thursday, Friday morning. The state could do the rebuttal Friday morning. I could charge the jury, and they will go out to deliberate Friday afternoon. Does that give you enough time? It does. Then I need to let the sheriff know that we don't need the jury until 1 tomorrow afternoon. And counsel, do you want to, what time do you want to come in and go over the jury instructions? Um, I thought Nine. you said 8.30. But 8 8.30 is fine. I just didn't know if you asked, are you asking to change that? Well, we just talked about it and you oh, said you wanted time for your closing. I don't know how much time the state's going to need. Do you want to start at 10 o'clock on the instructions? Do you want to start at 10.30 on the instructions? 
or do you rather do it in the morning because you're not going to start your closing till one in the afternoon uh, early in the morning would be better and uh, mr manti will be representing us i just need to update my my so closing do you say argument. you get to sleep later than mr. no i'll manti be here is. i'll be here at seven or, or earlier probably 6 45. but I, i'm just saying all that i would like to have more time to be able to input whatever changes are made into my closing argument presentation so i would prefer at 8 30 or nine o'clock if we could Nine o'clock it is. Court will be in recess till nine o'clock. We'll have the jury in at one. Is there anything else that we needed to take up tonight? Now that we've moved to Friday, does it not make sense to just start closings Friday morning and then this mm -hmm. way we get all the closings in in one day and the jury gets charged? The reason I day. told you what schedule I wanted is because it makes sense to me. Okay? And it gives you the time. It gives you plenty of time to prepare for your closing. And the state has indicated they don't need any more time, so we'll be in recess till 9 a.m.